She is amazingly funny. She's amazingly hardworking. Uh, she's one of the most connected NFL resources there are in the league. And Scoop City is right now booming as a podcast, as an information center, specifically amongst a female audience, which are very bright football fans as well. It drops Tuesdays and Fridays from The Athletic via The New York Times alongside Chase Daniels. She does an amazing job. Our friend Diana Rossini. Diana, how are we doing? You're amazing. Thank you so much for that intro. I'm good. I mean, talking football on a Sunday, it, it's funny. The older I've I've gotten, uh, the more I've enjoyed football Sunday. You know, I, I mean, I've always liked it as a reporter covering it, but maybe that's just reflective of I don't really have a lot of fun in my life anymore, that this is like, <laughs> this is my fun. You know, whereas when we were all single, hanging out, Friday night, Saturday night, going out, that was like the peak of your week. But for me, like especially with the London games now, to wake up and have football on, uh, th this is awesome. So so you're catching me on, on, on my joyful day. And it's way better, obviously, to experience the NFL while sitting on the couch wearing an Adidas hoodie versus out at a stadium and being trapped with only one game to watch. Oh, it's such a different experience. <laughs> it is so different. We're talking, you know, 10 years of being at arenas and stadiums and fields and flying and trying to catch that flight back. But then you get stuck and you got to stay. Oh, it's just so. Yes. I, here's what I love about it most, though, is I'm able to consume and also communicate better on Sundays with the people I need to talk to. So I'm actually doing my job better now that I'm home. Um, so, look, I miss players. I miss being out there, especially after great moments. There's no replacing that. Um, but it's pretty cool to cook Sunday dinner for my family while also taking in some games. So my house smells incredible. I wish that you could smell it, but, uh, that's, that's the only other thing I do pretty well, which is cook. <laughs> the obvious answer or the obvious next question is what is being cooked? In a house How home? long have you known me? How long have you known? What do you think we're making? It's Sunday or it's, it's sauce, Boston. right? We're making sauce and meatballs. Sauce and meatballs. We're seeing is a Rossini signature sauce from your mom's side or from your dad's side or your own concoction? Great question. Family debate between my brother, sister, and I about whose sauce is the best because mm -hmm. each of us have taken it from a parent. And so my brother took it from my dad. My sister took it from my mom. I kind of mixed both of them and kind of created my own thing. And I married a man who's not Italian, but he's a recipe follower. The, you know, those types that just cook by the actual measurements. Like I don't oh, do sure. that obviously because I'm very type B he's super type A. Um, so he has now become this tremendous cook. Mm. Uh, thanks Giada, I guess, but like, yeah, he just <laughs> follows like the cookbook <laughs> and it, and it's really good. But, um, when I cook, um, it's, you know, it's, it's just a little bit of everything I, I take from both my parents and I think it's pretty good. It's a feel thing. Right. I mean, you have to just feel out how the sauce is going to work that night. I think if you if you adhere to like an instruction booklet, basically a recipe, you lose a little bit of the soul of cooking. I agree. I my mom makes incredible meatballs and my dad's theory on it is he's like, she has no idea what she's doing. I think it's the oils <laughs> in her skin. It's the oils in her skin. Like she doesn't even chop the onions that well. Like my, my husband was actually explaining it to his father this morning because they were discussing recipes and uh, I overheard him talking about it. He's like, my mother-in-law, I don't even know what the hell she's making. I don't even know what's in the bowl, but it tastes <laughs> incredible. So I think the specialty is to have that Mediterranean oil in your skin uh, mm. to give it a little bit of that extra jazz. But to have the feel, I, I feel like we can easily apply that to football in terms of like watching some of these decisions that yes are analytically driven but watching those making decisions just based on the feel i'm always i'm always on that side of it give me the decision making process in cleveland for why joe flacco was out of a job yet again after leading the browns to the playoffs the cinderella remarkable run the browns offense suddenly looked good and then once again, they doubled down to Deshaun Watson. He ends up in Indianapolis and had a really good day on Sunday. So why didn't the Browns hold on to Flacco? I know. When you had Joe Flacco in there, it appeared that Kevin Stefanski's offense was so easy to run. Like, and, and he was orchestrating something every single week that, that looked remarkable. And they were able to overcome so many obstacles. And you just see them this year struggling. They can't find it. So, you know, when you go back to the off season and Joe Flacco's side, you know, approach the Cleveland Browns along with the Miami Dolphins and some other teams around the league, you know, to try to see, Hey, like this is obvious, right? Especially Cleveland. This is, this is obvious. We're going to do this again. We had success. 
uh, they were pretty stunned that Cleveland said no. Uh, and, you know, when I dug on it a little bit and then also even just having conversations around the league with people that are looking at the situation, m- m- a lot of people agree with what Cleveland did, which which mm-hmm. I think is really interesting. And that is put all their assets and focus on Deshaun and, and make sure there are no obstacles in his way. There's no mental hurdles of the crowd chanting for the backup quarterback who gave some success to them last year, uh, perhaps uh, not bringing someone that could possibly outshine them. Because look, it, there is a big business element here. They're paying him everything. So they've got to give him a path to at least try to have success this season. And I think that was the thought. And and now fans are going, well, what about that thought of winning? Right? Because this isn't the answer. And and obviously not even having Joe, Fl- you know, Joe Flacco is not having any influence on Deshaun. He's been given some really good opportunity here to take that step. And, and, and he's just not, you know, we, I think we saw a little bit in the Raiders game, you know, that was his best game uh, as a Brown this season. Granted, they didn't win. Um, and I, I actually thought that, that they were going to build on it this week despite the fact that the commanders are red hot and everything that they're doing is just electric at this point, I thought maybe we'd see these glimpses again of that Houston Deshaun Watson. And I, I feel like we say that every game and I don't know. I think sometimes we may have to, or not sometimes we may just all have to go. The magic may be gone. You know, it makes completely logical, pragmatic sense for what the Browns did. They've paid 200 plus million dollars to Deshaun Watson. As you said, you've just, He's your guy. You can't not make him the guy. Nobody's going to trade for that contract. You can't deal him. It can't. Your future isn't 40 some odd year old Joe Flacco. And yet there is no doubt when you see Flacco out there throwing dimes today, it feels like, did we make a bad choice? Do you think there's any regret that the Browns let Flacco walk and have hitched their entire wagon to Deshaun? I don't know if there's going to be regret. I think ownership assigned Kevin Stefanski and his general manager, Andrew Barry to make this work. And they discussed it and they obviously were all on board with, with doing this. So for them to all be in on this, I don't think they could sit there now and go, Oh, maybe we should have done this because either way, at the end of the day, I think they were told that they need to make this work and ownership wanted this to work. So you, you, the efforts are being put forth, but I just don't think that enough is being done. And look, it's not all on Deshaun. And that's something that that I, um, I've i had some conversations with people in Cleveland about the problems, trying to sort through it. it it's, it's not. It's a lot of the different units that really aren't stepping up. Obviously, we've seen the offensive line have tons of issues, uh, much different than what we saw last year when Flacco was under center. Um, it just, you know, remember too, they lost, they lost uh, Bill Callahan, right? He was the offensive line coach. Um, he's now in Tennessee with, with his son. And I mean, they have their own issues too at offensive line, but coach Callahan is revered around the league. And, and I do think that they had a nice setup in Cleveland with him running the show. So they've gone through some coaching transition there. Uh, the defense with Jim shorts leading the way, they were spectacular last year. They were, they were ranked in the top 10. Now, now they're swimming around the twenties. Um, so I, I think it's, it's just Sean. Yes, but it's, it's, it's everything in Cleveland right now. And, and I'm sure while, while ownership is disappointed, I, I think there's a lot of blame to go around before fame and fortune at the athletic and before fame and fortune at ESPN, you were an intrepid reporter in Washington, DC. And so you saw the very worst of the Washington football franchise. You saw dysfunction, you saw infighting. You saw just employees that did not like coming to work. And now, boy, does this feel different. How does it feel to look on from the outside and be like, wow, that's a healthy, profitable, functional franchise? They were doing the wave during the game. (laughs) The wave. Think, when was the last time you saw the wave? It's like every, they're, 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 it's like they're cracked out. (laughs) <laughs> in the best way. You think about how happy you have to be to participate in that. It is the corniest of all cheers, but I've, I've participated and 
you, you do that when you feel united, when you feel like you're all in this together and you're feeling joy at the same exact moment. That is what the wave represents to me. And uh-huh. that's what I saw in Washington. And I can tell you, I never saw the wave when I was covering that team. I saw a lot of moves. <laughs> I saw cans getting thrown on the field. I saw people waving goodbye, you know? Uh, so look, I, it's funny. I, t- I tweeted a few weeks ago, D, that after it was one of the, I think it was the, it was coming out party. It was Jaden's like real, like, holy cow moment. Uh, and I remember going to bed thinking, man, Washington's going to be electric in the morning. The, there's nothing better than the morning in Washington, D.C. after a win. There's there's a buzz because, you know, obviously politics drives, you know, drives the nation's capital and our government. Um it, there's a lightness that's added. It's tense there. It's serious. But when Washington's winning, it's everyone's in a good mood. Better decisions are being made. There's peace in the world. That's what it actually feels like. Mm. Um, I just, I remember being really young when I covered them and, and when they would win, I would go walk to get coffee and everyone wanted to talk to me about, about the then Washington Redskins. So um, I tweeted about it and man, fans get so mad fans from other teams. Like anyone from Washington saw me tweet, like was like, yeah, she's right. Like it's incredible the next day, but every city feels that way. Every city feels like when their team wins, there's nothing better the next day. Uh, I've lived in seven of them, seven different cities covered seven different, uh, fan bases. But to me, I don't know. There's just something special about Washington when they're doing well. So it's really cool to see that this is working with the new ownership all the way down from Cliff Kingsbury joining this team and, and connecting completely mentally with, with this rookie quarterback who we knew was good. We knew was special. We'd heard about it. Uh, but the his ability to process information the way he has and to look this good so early, I mean, it, it's just, just absolute standing ovation for this Washington staff. Just up 95 from D.C. is Baltimore. And the Ravens, they pull one out of the hat against the Bengals today. Another crushing loss for Joe Burrow, where he did almost everything he possibly could, but they still find a way to lose. And the Ravens got that massive run in overtime from Derrick Henry. I mean, two years, 16 million bucks feels like chump change to get Derrick Henry right now. Why didn't Henry command a better price tag in the offseason? All right. So I think there's a there's a couple issues here. Um you look at what he was doing in Tennessee at the end. The foundation of the team at the moment, at the time, excuse me, that was not very good. Remember, their O line was terrible. That roster was trash. They were not great. They were not, they were doing the most uh, in Tennessee with, with trying to have some sort of pulse. Um, you know, and if, as you recall, obviously they, they wound up firing everybody because it just it was not working. They were going to move on from Ryan Tannehill. They were going to move on from Derrick Henry. Everyone just felt like the time was up. It was it was over. Um, so I think a lot of people around the league saw Derrick on film and, and kind of agreed that, you know what, his best years are behind him. And, and then also, I guess scientifically, his best years are behind him. Uh, but here we are again. Um, but then, you know, normally we're talking about the quarterbacks getting older, the Joe Flacco's and, and, you know, Tom Brady's always used as an example, Aaron Rodgers, even when he looks phenomenal, not, not, not great in London, but he's had some moments this season where he's been awesome. Um, you know, where I, I think a lot of people just thought Derek was going to get old and, and was old and maybe a little clunky. And guess what Derek Henry is not right now. He is not clunky. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and look, he, it works in this offense. It works with this offensive line, uh, credit to Todd Munkin for, for being able to really orchestrate something that looks really good. And, and, you know, I, I have a great relationship with Derek Henry and I stay in touch with him and I, 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 he loves this man. He loves being in the spotlight. He's not, he's not the loudest human being. He's pretty laid back. Uh, but I think he's enjoying this. Um, just the way Saquon Barkley is in Philadelphia when they're having mm. success. There's a similar, uh, everyone kind of thought I was done getting old, that running back anger. Uh, and and those two are, are, are appear to be blossoming at this point in their careers. You noted the Jets. I mean, I, I don't know what to say to Jets fans at this point in time. You'd have a better sense of this having been from a Jets family. But it's a season that began with so much promise. And now five weeks in, not only are they sub-500, but the coaching staff is under fire. The defense is under fire. The special teams is under fire. And the quarterback is under fire after a three-interception game in London. So what 
has gone so wrong? Who do you blame most out of this blame pie? By the way, you just revealed something that people don't know, which is that I grew up a Jets fan. Really? They don't know this? People don't know this. Jets fans don't know. Am I supposed to keep this undercover? I don't know. I think we're past that at this point in terms of like, I I mean, I obviously don't have rooting interest in any team anymore. Um, I love the teams that give me info. No, I'm just kidding. Um, (laughs) Kind of. Um, But I, I don't know. You can't remove what you grew up rooting for I, it's not yeah. like I, I can still be a journalist and, and and try to be objective but i like when they do well and, and i think the jets fan base thinks i live for them to to be in this place of horror and that's not what, at all and i i can never respond i want to tell them like hey you don't know me but my whole family are these big jets fans you know but look i, I think they're at a point right now where they are all in Right. Hence the reason why they're trying to trade for Devontae Adams. That's on the table. They've been in discussions with the Raiders for over a week now. Um, They want to give Aaron Rodgers every single item he needs to have success. And you ask the question of what is wrong. You asked me that same question when I was on your show a year ago. And nothing has really changed, you know, because not nothing has changed with the Jets. Their roster just got a little bit better from last year. Uh, and Aaron Rodgers is is healthy, semi-healthy now, right? Because now he's dealing with this ankle situation and he's getting banged up out there uh, because there have been some offensive line issues and some decisions made by him. Just it's football, it happens. Um, but, you know, there were moments in the game in London where, look, first of all, let's just give him credit for getting back in that game. I thought this thing was over. I was like, oh my gosh, Robert Sala is not going to be allowed back on this plane. Like th- there, there's no way, it's done. So the fact that they had that fight to, to get back in there and try to sort it out because they're just purely naturally talented. Uh, and, and that's where I, I'm encouraged and excited by this team. And Aaron even said, as long as we stick together, I still think we can, we can figure this out. I just don't know if it's in his control. I don't, as much as he can lean and as good as he is and as much of a grip he has on this organization, it may be a bigger issue than just Aaron Rodgers. They have never been able to out scheme another team. Have you noticed that? They're never able to do it. So until they can figure out how to do that and not put it all on Aaron, I I just think this is going to be an uphill battle. So with, with Devontae Adams, I mean, do you think that it's more likely than not he does end up with the Jets, or is there somebody else that could swoop in and grab him? Uh, the Saints are in. The Saints are definitely in. The Steelers are in. Um, you know, as you know, there, you know, he doesn't have a, 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 a no trade clause, so it's not like he has his choice. He just has his own preferences. And we've known for over a year now that Aaron Rodgers wants Devontae Adams. Arizona's original list of players that he wanted to join him. So it makes all the sense in the world. I know why Aaron Rodgers wants them. I know why Devonta Adams wants to play with Aaron. They've, they've had something great. It's apparent. He doesn't have a lot of trust with his receivers besides Alan Lazard. Um, and even that, you know, I could see Adam stepping in here and being, and Rogers being like, Oh my God, thank God. Uh, like this is a guy I know I can depend on. Um, but if a team gives, The Raiders, a better offer. Mark Davis is not going to go, well, Devontae loves Aaron. Let's take something bad for our organization to make him happy. No, they don't care. They're going to take the best deal on the table. So we'll see. And look, you got those teams like Buffalo, uh, Kansas City. They're lurking. They don't want to pay that type of draft compensation. They certainly don't want to pay that contract. But you never know. They're hoping this is a slow burnout. They're hoping... The Jets come back from London and maybe Woody doesn't sign off on this because he doesn't want to pay because he doesn't think that this could be enough or he doesn't think that's the answer. You got to figure Joe Douglas is probably pushing every chip in going, we need to bring this guy because he doesn't have a lot of time left. He's got to make this work. They've got to get to the Super Bowl. Robert Sala, I'm sure, is like, whatever you need. Um, so we'll see if if they can land it. Um, you know, we've been told, when I say we, I just feel like everyone's reporting at this point, um, that this thing could heat up. Um, when they get back from London, which they got on a plane right after uh, they lost, whereas Minnesota stayed, which I'm sure they're having a nice little party there, uh, enjoying going 5-0. and Incredible. Uh, but we'll, we'll see what the mood, the tone, the decision-making is, because that, that's a rough flight home for them. 
is the sticking point on trading for Devontae Adams for GMs or owners? Is it the draft compensation that it would command, or is it the money that that he would have to be paid out? Because he makes almost a million dollars per game check, right? Yeah, it's it's the money, right? So it's about thirteen point five mil that they'd have to uh, take over, um, and, and it'll get a little bit less as we continue to go. Uh, which is why a lot of teams are hoping this drags out because then they don't have to pay that much. And then they're like, oh, well, I'll hop in. Let's ruin this. <laughs> Mess it up. Uh, so we'll we'll see how they sort that out. But, you know, most teams, this is a one-year rental. This is a one-year rent. This is it. This is for this year uh, because it gets too expensive um, for, for a team to keep them on past this year. Um, I know Devante has some concerns, too, about that. You know, he doesn't really want this to be a one-year situation. Um, so – you know, we'll, we'll, we'll kind of see how this shakes out. I think there's going to be a lot of stuff going on over the next few days. So the longer it goes to where he's not traded, the worse off it is for a team like the Jets because it would mean more suitors would jump in because the contract would be less, fewer weeks left in the season. Correct. Now, the Jets would love for to squeeze them too, though, because then they'd have to pay less. So, you know, when I talk to sources about the situation, I'm told uh, – pretty consistently that we're, you know, the jets are in no hurry. We're in no hurry. Well, they're in no hurry because they don't want to pay, mm -hmm. but they want to get Devontae Adams on their team. They've got the bills. The bills are going to be trying to bounce back here after getting beat, uh, after losing two in a row and, and, and losing to the Houston Texans. So, um, we'll, we'll, we'll see if that urgency changes and if they're, if they're a little bit more, if they're quicker to, to get this done so he can be at practice this week. Mm. Scoop City is such a good listen. You and Chase Daniel have such a good rapport. It's an easy listen. It's an informed decision, obviously. Uh, informed conversation. Chase played for a long time. He's a really bright guy about quarterbacks and about offense. And you have great information. And what I think it's doing is it's re resonating with an audience, and specifically a female audience. You guys are crushing it with the female NFL fans, huh? Yeah, I, I think women are are way more into football than I than I thought. Um, and, and I see it just in my, in my life, in my personal life, um, my friends, the, the type of questions they ask me, I met up with a girlfriend, uh, yesterday in, in the city and she wanted to like rip through each game. She's never done that before. <laughs> I'm like, what do you want to know? She, and, and look, I do think gambling has helped with some of that excitement. I think women like to be part of that, or even if they are dating someone or married to someone that loves football, they want to be part of the conversation instead of just sitting in the other room. Um, I also think the Taylor Swift effect is real as heck I, oh. I, and it's awesome. And I love it. I love that she's part of football. Um, I know some football fans are annoyed by it. And I, I, lo I think the, the more she can, uh, bring attention to a game we love and is fun. Once you learn it, it's not that hard. You know, one of the things that, uh, a, a friend of mine said, it's actually a woman that lives on my street. She said, I really like your show because it's, it doesn't scare me. She goes, I get really scared by their shows. And I know what she means. And I and I think because I've been there before too, where um if I try to hop in on a podcast, if I'm on, if I'm like trying to catch up on some hockey stuff, I'll avoid super serious shows that are really inside. I'm like, because I get, oh, I don't know, I don't know. I can't, I don't even know who that player is, you know. Sure. Whereas I feel like we can have really pretty serious conversations, very similar to what you and I are doing now, where it's like, you know, we're talk, we're talking about the real topics. But I want to have a conversation about it that is, is memorable, but you can feel part of, that you understand, that you can follow um, without getting too crazy about, you know, what scheme, you know, Brian Flores ran in the third quarter to put the pressure on the day line. Like, you know, like whatever, whatever. And look, I care. I value that information. I study that stuff when I'm not collecting information. I listen actually to tons of podcasts that are super nerdy on purpose. Cause I have to stay sharp, especially when I'm having conversations with people in football. I can't just stay kind of just be regular all the time. I have to have depth to what I'm doing. Um, so there's a space for that and there's a space for this. So I'm, I'm hoping more women keep, if there, if there is a show that women want to check out and they're not too sure about, like, I, I hope Scoop City is the place they start. And, and if it stinks, you know, just fast forward. <laughs> Chase is cute. Check Chase out. <laughs> No, and I think the Taylor Swift effect, you're right, is is a good thing for football because if it's a doorway into look at how cool this sport is and look at how accessible the sport is and look, Taylor's into it because once a week you get an event and that's unlike any other sport aside from college football, 
Every week you get one big event. You don't have to watch every single day. You don't have to invest three or four times a week. But for one day a week, it's a glorious, beautiful thing. And it it's is. accessible in that way. And so, yeah, I could see why a lot of female football fans would gravitate to your podcast and your show. That's a pretty cool thing. Yeah, I also share a lot of my stuff that I'm going through. Um, as a mom of two, I'm married, uh, I have a new house, I have responsibilities, and I'm not really great at life. So, like, I'm okay at the work thing, but I kind of stink at everything else. So, I'm pretty open with Chase. Chase is really Chase is like an incredible dad, an amazing husband, uh, and he's got three kids. So a lot of our show is me sharing some disaster that I was part of, and <laughs> hopefully there's some relatability there. I hope there's some women and e and even some 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 men out there who who hear what I'm doing and choosing to do and going, yeah, I've done that. It's it's, it's not awesome. Uh, so yeah, I think I think there's an an element of hopefully relatability to the show as well. One clip that uh, that went viral of yours recently was when you trashed your husband for moping around the house after the Eagles lost to the Falcons in week number two. I'm wondering emotionally where he's at now because it feels like the walls continue to close in on the Eagles. Yeah, it's a wreck here. Um, <laughs> so we're thinking about redoing our basement and we want to make it a real sports theme vibe in there between some of the stuff that I've done over the years for work and his Philly fandom. And we're just like ripping through things that we want up there that are special moments. And I, I said, well, what about the, you know, stuff from this season, any, any guys that we'd want to put photos in there? And he's like, no, no one yet. No one. I'm like <laughs> nothing from Jalen. No. Okay. Uh, yeah. So it's, it, he, he's touchy is irritable okay. Okay. Uh, is probably the way I would, I would describe it. And, and look, having a buy this weekend was really good for our home because um, we could like he's, he's, calm, he's calm like he's with the kids right now like they're gonna you know he's just in a good mood because the eagles aren't playing um but i will say so that so that i went on levitard and it went viral because it was the tuesday after the monday night game where philly lost and yeah. we just had a rough morning here because he was a jerk because they lost and so i i was as raw as it comes like i just i was crushing kev uh because i was in, i was like in a fight with him um, but I will say we went to a party in Philly that weekend and I had so many wives of his friends come up to me and just be like, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for calling out their stupidity. <laughs> and by the way, these women are just as big as, you know, they're Eagles fans themselves. They're nuts in a great way, but they, they understand that, you know, you have, you cannot allow it to control your house and the decisions you make and your relationships with your children. So, um, we're, we're, we're a work in progress. Yeah. Those women are more emotionally balanced. They, they are not as uh, stunted developmentally as guys are about sports. They are actually reasonable, balanced human beings that love sports, but they don't have it wreck their entire lives for a week. Yeah. I, I say to them all the time. I'm like, Saquon doesn't know you. He doesn't <laughs> care about you. You know, he's like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> You know, so I, and 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 it's funny. I interviewed Saquon a few weeks ago, and I I, I said, hey, um, you know, I want to Facetime my husband because, and I never do this day ever because it's just unprofessional in my opinion. Like I, sh I like to separate it, but I knew Kev would just like melt if Saquon Facetimed him because uh, my husband also went to Penn State, so there's like a little bit of that. Uh -huh. So one of the biggest fights that we've had in our home since the day I met him has been, he's bad with his phone. Like he doesn't answer. He doesn't text back. He's just like, he's just a chill person. He's not like anxious. Like I am staring, keeping up with the world. So of course I FaceTime him with Saquon Barkley in Saquon's home. And we're ready to do this whole fun thing to say hi to Kev. And guess who doesn't answer? Oh, no, no, no. no. His loss. So I like to remind him of that all the time. Like, remember Saquon was going to say what's up and talk to you. So you yeah. blow it, Kev. You blow it. Yeah. Uh, every Tuesday and Friday, Scoop City drops. It is Diana Rossini and Chase Daniel via the Athletic. Certainly, it's a must-watch, a must-listen to podcast or on YouTube as well. And uh, follow Diana on all of her social media platforms because the scoops are all over the place. She's one in a million. I love having her here on the show. And for joining us on Watch DA Live tonight, she will receive a bottle of Santo Tequila. This is Guy Fieri's signature tequila. Sammy Hagar also is part owner in this. It is delicious. It is crisp. It is clean. You are going to love it. And Santo's thrilled to have you on. I gave them a potential guest list because I reached out to you and a few other people right before the season began. And 
They said, who do you think you might have on? So I gave them the list. And no joke, the PR person said, Diana Rossini? All right, that's awesome. I can't wait for her to get the bottle of Santos. So you got a lot of fans out there. Well, they must see my my liquor cabinet and see all their product. That's probably why they were excited. They're like, oh, we've seen in her shots before, uh, especially with the way this Eagles season is going. There's a lot of <laughs> right. you know, running around in this house. So uh, I am the perfect person to join the show for someone that is looking for a bottle. So thank you for having me on. Uh, I love you so much. I'm so glad uh, that things are working out for you. And, and gosh, we've been friends for a while now, man. Like we're getting to that point where it's getting weird. It's like, man, have I known you for almost 20 years. Like, you know, it's like it's it's just oh, getting man. to that point. But but I'm glad that I'm glad we're on this ride together, man. No question about it. Diana Rossini joining us here on the show. Thanks, Diana. Bye, guys.